So we are here for our fourth installment of the Uncommon Mind series, She's a Boss. And today we're welcoming Miss Mitzi Miller. I'm so excited to have her. I mean, full disclosure, I've known Mitzi for ever. Let's just put it that way. Um, <laughs> decades. <laughs> And she is a true friend, the kind of friend who comes out to help you when you didn't ask for help. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Mitzi. I mean, listen, I'm a friend, first and foremost. Uh, I'm a daughter. Uh, I am also currently the head of development at a television and film production company. Uh, before I ventured into television and film, I had a long 15 plus year career in print journalism. So during that time, I was an entertainment journalist, a writer, uh, became an author, and also the editor-in-chief of both Jet Magazine and Ebony Magazine. She's a Black History Month fact, y'all. Just, just <laughs> I am, I am. So it has been a really long and illustrious career. And when I think about your careers, I just think about all of the things that you've done. When I think about you being a blogger, a novelist, a journalist, an editor, a producer, a podcast host, just so much packed into that career. What was your decision process as you made each of those major moves? And how did you decide what could coexist with the other? So I think for me, um, the, one, the one consistent behavior that I've used is always leaning into yes. Mm. That's a lesson that my mom taught me from young. Um, even when you're scared, say yes. Even when it doesn't, when an opportunity pre presents itself, it's, we are often so quick to rule it like it's above me or I, I didn't think about that or it's not what I'm doing now. Mm. Um, I think it's served me well to always be like, huh, that sounds interesting. Okay, I'll try and sort of always operating from a beginner's mindset where I'm willing to learn. So if I know that I don't necessarily need to know everything when I'm walking in, mm -hmm. um, I've been, you know, there's been a willingness there to try and fail. Yeah, so it's, so it's interesting because I remember one of your really early jobs when you were at Jane Magazine. And it used to be like the follow Mitzi day. And it'd be like Mitzi in a ballet leotard. And I was like, what is happening? Do you think that, you know, to all of those silly situations or new situations, that's really what made you successful and made other people able to relate to you and relate to those type of types of columns? Absolutely. I think that one of my superpowers is uh, honesty and accessibility. We are the same. I always tell people that. Um, if you feel it, I probably felt it too. The difference is how we process it. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm humble enough to be willing to embarrass myself. I'm humble enough to be willing to stumble and get up and then tell you, oh, I fell. Yep, definitely fell. This is what happened. This is how it feels. So you don't have to do it. Um, <laughs> That's amazing yeah. because so many people can't or won't learn from the mistakes of others, the examples of others. But I think that willingness to share with people shows them that they can, shows them that they can feel comfortable um, and that it's good for them, honestly. Yeah, we build our strength to run a vulnerability. Oh, I chopped that word up, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, we, you, you, it's not weakness right. to um, attempt and fail. Right. The, the, the tragedy is when you won't even attempt because of this limiting self-belief, you know? Hmm. Hmm. So that's an interesting concept, this limiting self-belief. Um, years ago, I read this, I read this book and the, the premise of this book was really about how our own perceptions shape our performance. So they, they did actually empirical studies where they would prompt people with their stereotypical limitations and then have them execute something. So they would remind people or they would remind girls that women aren't good at math. And then they would have them do a math test. And they would perform worse, you know? So I really, I, really, I really believe exactly what you're saying in terms of how our belief drives our ability to move forward or not. Yeah. 
I recently had a conversation with a friend where we were discussing the idea and my belief that 95% of this journey, like our lives, is all mental and all energy. If you believe, you can. Yeah. And granted, it's not like, oh, I believe I can fly, therefore I can. Mm -hmm. It is more of, I have the ability to push through anything that I put my mind to. And if I hit one wall, as long as I keep going, at some point, I'm going to reach the success. It may not look exactly like I thought it would, but I will eventually be successful. So I've been, I've just been thinking about this concept of the Renaissance person lately. I've just been thinking like the 2000s, the 2020s, especially you see somebody and there was like a, a, a reel on Instagram and it was like this girl and it was like every person on Clubhouse. And it was like, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a this, I'm a that, I'm a this. Multi-hyphenate. Yes. <laughs> But it's, but it's absolutely true. You know, so many people are doing so much more. Do you believe in that concept of the Renaissance person? And do you believe it that we have the ability to reach the highest levels at multiple things at the same time? Absolutely. I've been a multi-hyphenate for a very long time. But I think that if you have an imagination from the time we're kids, there's so few of us that are single-minded enough to say, I only want to do this and be this my whole life. Right. I remember people would ask me what I want to do when I grow up and I come up with every range of answer from I want to be an ice skater to I want to be a large animal vet to I want to be an astronaut so I want to be a scientist to I want to be the only thing I didn't say it quite frankly is I want to be a writer everything I under the sun I have said I wanted to be and so I I believe that we all have multiple talents and as long as we're willing to dedicate the time to honing them, we can be really good at them. Now, excellence, excellence is another level, right? Excellence requires a certain amount of focus. Mm -hmm. But in the world that we live in, being very good at multiple things can, can garner you an equal amount of success as someone that is excellent at exactly one thing. And okay. if it's creating joy, right? Because that's the thing. These multi-hyphenates are just pursuing different areas in their life that bring them joy. Right. Then it's all worth it. Okay. So how did you choose? So it's, it's interesting to me that you said you never said I wanted to be a writer because mm -hmm. I always remember you as a storyteller, a natural storyteller um, <laughs> from the beginning, right? So when did you kind of when did that click for you? When did you make that switch and say, no, this is something that I can make a career out of. This is something that I am excellent at. So I stumbled into the writing aspect. I, you are correct. I love telling stories. I love spinning stories. I love giving my opinion, but that is all talk and conjecture and imagination. Um, the actual sitting down and writing came about when I got my intern um, and my internship at Honey Magazine. Mm -hmm. where I realized that the way to spin my talent of storytelling, my interest in and desire to be a storyteller, one avenue of that was to become a paid writer. Right. Okay. But trust, if I could have been a radio DJ, that's what I would be today. If I could <laughs> okay. sit down and talk all day, yeah, no, I absolutely would have been like a talk show host. I would have been a radio DJ. And, you know, I, I still might, you never know. Um, but because for me... The love is the stories, right. but love, that's what I love. Um, I am not like the medium, I, I'll go with it. If I'm hosting a podcast, if I'm writing a book, if I'm writing an article for a magazine or newspaper, if I'm creating a television series or a movie, at the heart of it, I love telling dynamic stories about specifically about people of color when I have my choice with everything that is going on in the world. And it's not new for people of color. You know, it's, it's new for everyone else. It's a discovery for everyone else. But this moment, this time um, is making it more, more possible, is making the world a little bit more accessible to tell these stories. How are you taking advantage of this particular moment in history? Well, I think that you're absolutely correct. There is um, a quote unquote discovery happening outside of the community of color right. about the amount of talent and experience and knowledge 
that we have. Um, and how I personally am taking advantage of it is by creating. Um, I, we are, I work as a head of development, we are focusing on finding new and varied diverse stories to put out there to sell. Mm -hmm. We're being aggressive in our selling tactics because we want to take advantage of the interest and willingness to purchase. And we're not just, and we're also being very mindful about presenting from the entire spectrum of blackness. We're mm -hmm. not just telling stories about African-Americans. Mm -hmm. You know, we're currently developing a series about an immigrant family. We're developing stories about people of color abroad. Like that I'm very deliberate about because I know in this moment you want black, but what I want is to deliver the understanding that black is not a monolith, that we are so diverse within our community. And there are so many beautiful, untold, important stories out there. So that's how I personally am taking advantage of it. I really love that. And so it's interesting that you say this. And of course, I'm going to bring up, you know, one of the Black stories that you've told in the past. So you know that I still think the, that the university in the Quad should have been called Batward. I'm <laughs> mad that it was called GAMU. We know where it came from. I just... I just I'm going to let it go-ish. I mean, I don't know how you could have thought that. Because if you looked at the campus, it was so clearly set in an environment that favored FAMU, which we know is actually the number one HBCU, period. Like, I'm just gonna let you know. have that. I'm just gonna say Camel. I mean, and I'll, I'll move on. Feel free. <laughs> feel free. <laughs> I'll move on. There is nothing better than FAMU as far as I'm concerned, but go right ahead. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna have to agree to disagree. <laughs> okay, just in this moment, just in this moment, because you know this Rattler is not backing down, but go right ahead. <laughs> okay, well, how was it bringing to life the HBCU experience? For me, you know, it was so critical because I went, to, I went to an HBCU at a time when, you know, it wasn't all of this social media, that every minute of our lives was not documented. And to actually see brought to life in that way was amazing. How was that bringing us that Black story? Listen, the HBCU experience, honestly, was amazing. And it shaped so much of who I am today, the way I think about community, friendships, and just the strength of the individual. Like I tell people all the time that if I had to name one thing that I learned at FAMU, it's that you don't take no for an answer. Yes. And I think that that's every student that's ever stepped foot on an HBCU. It may not be your, the, the number one lesson, but it's certainly amongst your top five lessons that you learn. Right. The, the, necess the need for persistence and the support of the people behind you pushing you to be better. Um, and so I, was very proud of the, our ability to bring that story to BET, especially because it being our platform. Yes. In, and in hindsight, I kind of wish it was now in this moment where there, would, there probably would have been a bidding war over it. You know, like there's more, so much more of an appetite, but that adds to the pride because I know what, what mountains we had to climb to get that story told. So just thinking about all of the stories, that's one side of the story, right? That's the, you know, every Black student seeking excellence and driving and, and choosing one path, which is to go to an HBCU. But there's another set of stories that you've been telling through the 70 million podcasts. And it's, been, it's been sobering, to say the least. Um, because, you know, when I listen to that, award-winning podcast, um, even the title just carries so much gravitas. We never think about the number in that way. 70 million is a fifth of the entire population of the U.S. Um, what impact do you think the podcast has had to date? Um, and how do you measure your success from it? Like, what do you, what do you hope is going to change through really hearing those stories and finally personalizing it even more. So I, I have to say, I am so proud to be a part of the 70 million team. Um, it is humbling. Mm -hmm. Like you said, that number, 70 million Americans have been incarcerated, like arrested and have a record. That is crazy. And, you know, if you're one of the lucky ones who is not, 
you're still not, you still know someone and you know that those arrests don't go away and especially how they impact our community. Mm -hmm. So being a part of the team that, you know, gets to bring this podcast to life that focuses on grassroots or organizations at the grassroots level that are trying to change the laws yes. to, to, to find different ways so that less of us can be incarcerated, so that more of us can get out and start again and have full, valuable lives. Um, it matters. And I think it's especially in this moment where people are blatantly examining the, the, detentions, um, the detention centers, the whole judicial system, it is under a microscope. Mm -hmm. And so to be a part of showing success stories, I feel, gives people small wins. And that's what keeps us going because we have enough of the losses every day. We are constantly being bombarded. All of our senses are being bombarded with the injustices. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a small relief to hear about people that are having these small wins that then snowball and become big deals. Yes. It's, so it, it's interesting, even like in some of our research, as we're um, putting the app together and looking at businesses and how businesses reach out into their communities, it's been just, you know, heartwarming to see those businesses who focus on um, rehabilitated individuals and bringing those individuals back into the workforce, knowing that the decks are stacked against him. And, and these are small businesses that are basically taking it upon themselves to say, no, this is happening to our community. These people are part of our community. Let's make sure that they come back into the fold. So uh, I love that you're doing that with the podcast. I love that we get to hear those stories. And I love that these are people that don't become just a number that they are rehumanized and have, you know, their faces, their true faces and their true humanity shown. Absolutely. I mean, we're all lucky that our worst moments didn't land us in jail and land us with a, with a, a title like felon right. that we'll never be able, that so few of us will be able to get rid of. Right. We're, we're, that, that's the blessing of those that haven't been in the system. And a blessing is what it is. It's not sure. necessarily our mm -hmm. act. <laughs> right. So switching gears for a minute, do you think that social media plays a large role in your space? Do you think that there are any new game changers out there? How are you leveraging it? And how are, how are you, if you are, using it to amplify your voice and your messages? Well, I'm certainly not doing as much as I should. I think you and I already had that conversation off. <laughs> but uh, yes, social media is a game changer across the board, especially in the entertainment and television and film. Like, Absolutely. Like, look at Clubhouse, such a simple concept that has become literally revolutionary. I mean, the idea that people talking could become a fad again, <laughs> it is so crazy to me. It's like, I love the reconnection over these small ideas, like these small, simple concepts create these huge waves and social media allows for them to be amplified because we might not have heard about Clubhouse if you weren't on Instagram or had a friend that was like, hey, what's this invite? Everyone's got this invite. I got an invite. I'm going to give you an invite. Like social media connects us in a way that we just didn't have before. Yeah. So you're forced to interact with people that are outside of your direct area of interest and community. Um, and I think that that is so helpful in, in terms of getting projects onto the radar of people that can amplify them on larger platforms. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's so helpful in terms of us being able to find diverse talent and not just diverse in ethnicity or race, but diverse in terms of train of thought and ability. Right. Um, you know, I think every there's, you know, there's the highs and the lows, but overall when harnessed, social media is absolutely a tool for good. Right. Uh, and we use it in the marketing of our projects in connecting with new talent, um, young unproven talent. That's how they find me. And I'm always like, I, by nature, I'm the, I'm a connector. So I'm always like, Hey, hit me up. If I can't do it, I'll find somebody that can. And I think that that social media, when used correctly, that is probably the greatest gift that it offers us. What has, what's changed about your projects and your work during the pandemic? Like this time has been so different for so many people. 
For some people, it's yeah. been a time of innovation. For others, it's been a time of sheer just survival. For right. some, it's been a time of, of transformation. How, how has the pandemic affected your work and, and what's shifted about that? So I think that the pandemic uh, provided a, like you said, it was, it was game changing. A lot of things have shifted, but for us, it allowed Rob and I, because our company is just two people. It's me and my partner, Rob Hardy. Um, it allowed us to take time to slow down and really examine what we had and why we cared about it before we just added more to sort of keep up with the churn. Mm-hmm. Our, our, our industry never came to a complete halt, but we were able to slow the hamster wheel down enough to sort of reassess and reground ourselves in our commitment to only creating things that we care about and we find meaningful. You know, when Rob and I started working together, the one thing we agreed was like every project we're going to produce, we're going to develop and produce it as if it is our last as if this is, you're going to die right after this. And this is what people are going to have to remember you by. Um, And that was our commit, you know, that was the initial commitment. And I think that we held probably 80% to that because when you're, you know, an honest reflection, we were about 80, 85% to that. But the reason for the, for the loss, um, the difference is that it was a volume game. It became a volume game. Like you got to keep coming up with things. You got to keep moving. Like you can't, the pandemic allowed us to chill. Like, do you really want to do the script? You know what, instead of only giving it one read through, why don't you take two read throughs, read it tonight and then check in the morning and see if you still feel it strongly. Mm -hmm. And it also, for those that made it through the call, you were like, okay, let's go harder for these. Let's make sure that we get these sold. Let's rededicate ourselves to working with these writers and getting these projects, these stories, these ideas out. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think think that we definitely benefited from that time. And you know, we've come out on the other side of it with the first look deal at Lionsgate. So I'm super excited about that because now we, we now have a home for our television stories at least. And um, that continues to open doors. Um, yeah, you know, 2020 was sort of a reckoning, I think for everybody. Mm-hmm. I think every, every once in a while, God will sit you on your butt and make you really, hey, are you, are you sure about this? And that, that's what it was for us. I, so I love I love to hear that because for me what I heard was it gave you a chance to sit in things to sit with things and let them marinate and let let you really see if they fit your mission and let you be more mission driven. So that's amazing. All right. Well, tell us what's next for you. What projects do you have coming up? What's on the radar? Goodness. So I mean, we're gearing up to start. Uh, another season of 70 million and you can find that podcast wherever you log in and f- get your podcast everywhere like, everywhere, everywhere. Uh, Rob and I are uh, what do we have oh we have a movie that I'm super excited about it's at Amazon it's called Two Butterflies um, and we are co-producing that with Juvie Productions and Viola Davis is set to star in that very very excited about that that's been a passion project of mine um tv we have a couple things that are not necessarily papered yet so i can't tell you okay but the movie is papered so yes two butterflies be on the lookout for that and i am you know settling my spirit and thinking about writing again and i haven't done that in a long time well i would love a new novel i tell you a new novel yes the vow okay let me tell you when I read the vow. update on the vow, right? <laughs> when I read the vow, I read that in hours. That wasn't like a day's thing. I literally sat down and was like, oh, so what is about to happen? So I would love a new novel. Yes. I was to the point where I was reading your teen novels. That's where I'm at. That's why I need a new well, I think, novel. You know, every time I've written fiction in the past, it's definitely been a reflection of where I am. I wrote the vow when I was 30 and desperately trying to get married and convince my boyfriend at the time that, listen, this is it. We might as well, like I was a whole jagged edge song. Um, And so now 15 years later, (laughs) exactly. um, I think, you know, I've given some thought to revisiting, Um, but then again, you know, Life is interesting. There's other things that have my attention as well. So we'll see. But I haven't had that itch in a while. So you never know. I might scratch that. 
I'm gonna just put it up to heaven that I'm looking for uh, the Val sequel plus okay. the quad sequel. <laughs> the quad sequel too. Okay, I hear that. These are my wish list. Thank you so much, Mitzi. This has been amazing. You have taught us so much in this little bit of time we've had together. And we hope to talk to you again soon. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Chris. Thank you.